what's going on what's going on with your life you're still um producing very cool glitch <laughs> that's digital true art. <laughs> i have i have so so many um uh, options here let's just cycle through a few of them yeah we've got this Yes. What what are you going to do with this? Because you should do like a little exhibition or something. <laughs> I've thought about that actually. Um, I think it would be super cool. Like people would come in and go, "What's going on here? Who is this weirdo?" <laughs> and everybody actually, that knows you would would understand the meaning of it. You know, that should actually be the name of the ex uh, of the exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> what is going on here? What? What is this that I'm seeing? <laughs> um, I, I but one question, I mean, your art is now being, I bet there's a bit of a challenge now with technology. You're getting less of this happening. Your it's computer true. doesn't. Um, yeah, we, we like updated our, um, our Red Hat Linux version uh, a few years ago. And it stopped producing this kind of um, frame buffer oh. thing, <laughs> and I was really disappointed. And like, I can, I, I can still find some ways to break things, but it's a lot harder now. It's not as art directable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I had so many, just like, um, uh, just in uh, in archives <laughs> that I haven't even uploaded yet. I have like dozens and dozens still just sitting cluttering up my desktop that I haven't uploaded. So I've got I've got a little bit of a of a backlog I, I can get through. Backlog, yeah. So what what are you up to right now? What are you what are you doing? I know you're super busy so thank you so much for, <laughs> for meeting us. Oh yeah happy to uh happy to join you. Um I just started a new project a few weeks ago at Pixar. Yeah. So I just came off of um, working on Lightyear, um, I had a little a little in between project with the tools department um, just for a few weeks. But um, but yeah, so I came off of working on Lightyear before this, um, and then before that, I worked for several months on the Disney Plus series mm -hmm. Cars on the Road, which will be coming out in September, I believe. And um, oh, that. How was that? Was it cool? Oh, it was fun. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because like there's some, you know, yeah. some of the stuff is what you, what you will expect from a Cars yeah. series. Um, and some of the yeah. stuff gets um, kind of weird. <laughs> and I got to work on some of the weird stuff, um, which I enjoy. Um, so I was working on some... Um, yeah, just some some sort of different looks, um, and I was working with yeah. um, some of the render man people to make those possible. And uh, yeah, it was a good time. Um, and so, what what is that? What, what how do you explain uh, when you were working with the render man people, trying to make things possible? Yeah. With that, without um, don't, don't worry too much about explain, breaking things down too much. But right. how do you see, what is it that you do? What what is your job? So uh, my job is um, uh, more often than not, my job is shading, which is um, look development, making things look like what they're made of, and so that could be something more straightforward, like oh, the wall in this building um, should look like it's exposed brick or um, it's made of painted um, sheetrock, um, or it's cinder block or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. You know, so a lot of that is like, you know, simulating real world materials, making things look um, convincing because, you know, there's a lot of things in our movies and they all have to look like something. <laughs> uh, there's that element to it, which is a lot of fun. I really enjoy that, that, has a lot of overlap with um, live action visual effects, which is just how do you make it really realistic and convincing. But then with animation, you have control over everything. You can build whatever you want from the ground up and it can, it doesn't have to look convincing. It doesn't have to look like the real world. You know, if it looked like, if you wanted it to look like the real world, you might just take a camera and shoot it. And so 
animation gives a lot of opportunities to make it look different and interesting and weird. And so every studio, every group of people um, has their own process, has their own collection of personalities and ideas. And so every studio makes something that looks different, which is why what we make looks very different from what Sony makes, what DreamWorks, make, DreamWorks makes, what um, places have different looks. And so, you know, we might make something like Toy Story 4, which looks pretty realistic, you know, around the same time that Sony Animation is making Into the Spider-Verse, which looks like a, a living comic book. You know, each has their own benefits and drawbacks, but like every look that you kind of target, whether it's comic booky, whether it's looks like an illustration, whether it looks like a photograph, it comes with its own set of challenges. Um, how do you make it render on the farm? How do you make the tools accessible to everybody? And so that's what I focus a lot with is like bridging the gap between the artists and the technology authors to try and make something that's usable by artists to create new and interesting looks. Which means you need to be able to talk to the artists with their mm -hmm. framework and their way of understanding the world and art <laughs> yeah. and the technical <laughs> people who sometimes will be very interested in the art and sometimes not <laughs> yep <laughs> that's exactly right yeah we, we will have um uh artists who um you know they don't need to know all of the like precise technical terms and they might even misuse them sometimes and so um <laughs> because you know that's not what they have been trained that's not the vocabulary that they've been trained with. And so I think I am pretty good at pretty equally well speaking um, artist and speaking nerd and translating those to each other. And sometimes it means understanding what an artist, you know, not just understanding the their, their frequency, their, their vocabulary, but like what they want, what kind of controls they're going to want, like what kind of ideas are they going to have once they see, anticipate what they are going to want and talk to the developer to figure out how to um, empower them to do that. And, and so that by the time they are using it, they can just have an idea and work and, and, and try it out rather than like have an idea, not be able to do it and then ask for it. And then it takes days or weeks or something like that before they can actually express their idea. If I think about you, I see you much more on on the artist side of the world. I know that now you are in between. Yeah. You know, you're bridging, you're, you're the, the connector. But I always, the way you talk and the way you look at the world, I think about you like an artist, even if you have a strong technical background. And has that, uh, has that shifted a little bit lately or do you still see yourself I, I, it's definitely shifted back and forth a little bit over the last couple of years. On Luca, for example, I was, uh, my role was not shading artist, but I was a sequence lead. And a sequence lead on our movies means you sort of take ownership of, of a scene in the movie. How can we shepherd this through? How can we make sure that we can actually render this um, you know, how can we make this look as good as possible? How can make, we make sure everything is working? How can we make sure the lighters have what they need to create a beautiful image? How can we make sure the, the animators have the tools available to try out some stylized animation? And so it's, there's a lot of working on the pipeline and the process and understanding the technical foundation beneath everything and making sure that that works. And that's great. I love it. I love those kinds of technical challenges because they're in service of an artistic end. And that's wonderful. But at the end of a project like this, I, I have to go back to shading for at least a year and just be like, look, now I just want to make pictures. Now I just, I just want to focus on creating something beautiful. And like, I can, that can be informed by my technical understanding, but like, I don't want my job to be debugging things, um, fixing problems, coming up with yeah. workflows, all that stuff. Like that's all really fun, but like, I don't want it to come at the exclusion of the art. And so I have to actively try and 
get back to the art because it's easy to drift away from it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. It's also interesting. I can see you there going, where are the crayons? <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> yeah, <over>. very much. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, now, because when we started talking, you, you were fresh blood at Pixar. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, yeah. Uh, like the people we know have been there for many years and, and yeah. you know, Zaya and all that. And, yeah. and you had only been there for like a couple of years. At that point, yeah, it was just a few years. Yeah. I mean, but you had a very strong vision. You had a very strong way of talking about the history that a texture tells you about an object and the other way around. Yes. How, how looking at that history would tell you how it should look. So you were going backwards. So in reality, you were reading the history while on your film, you were yeah. building that history in the textures and in the way that object was shaped, right? But you had a very strong, I remember it was really cool to hear you talk about all that because you had a very powerful way of making that a narrative of how objects live. Yeah, I, that was, um, well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the, um, the key to being, I think, a good shading artist is understanding um, the history of, of a surface. And so, you know, you can kind of, um, you, yeah, you can think of it in a few ways. Like, you know, if you're just looking at something and trying to recreate it, you know, just by looking at something, you can kind of figure out how it came to be um, in the state that it is, you know, whether it's um, a, a pattern of, you know, I live in the Bay Area, which has a lot of hills and a lot of parking garages, like underneath the buildings, so you have to go down a little ramp to get into them. And so I am very used to seeing um, sidewalks with like scrapes on them because of a car like scraping the underside as it's going down or like scraping the front as it's going up um and um and so it's interesting to just look at the world around you and and get a sense of like what how people interact with this thing how they use it how it came to look the way it is um and so that's kind of looking backward and so when i think about um when when the time comes to to shade something a terrain or a um or a, a prop or, or something like that the first thing i want to think about is like or, or and the first kind of questions i will ask is um how is this used how old is it um i want um rather than starting from the image and trying to figure out the story i try and establish a story so I can create the image based on that. Um, so, um, yeah, it's yeah. a very, it's a very fun way of thinking and it's not technical at all. <laughs> you know, it, it does require some understanding of like, you know, science or chemistry sometimes depending on the thing. Yeah. Um, and physics and uh, yeah. yeah, you need to, yeah, you do need to think about, oh, sorry, just a moment. Yeah, it does. It does mean you look at how the world behaves and how the physics and the impact and the friction yeah. and, and all that. So, but yeah, it's not. You're not exactly trying to calculate or translate that into data. You're translated into art. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Like you know, if you have, um, I don't know, like wooden like tongs for a barbecue or something like that you might imagine like oh the wood the varnish on the wood will wear away where you're where you're holding it and it's because you understand like how you know acid you know depending on what yeah. you're cooking or or like oil, the oils in your hand or something might eat away at the varnish yeah. um but you don't need to know like the chemical makeup of all these things you don't need to perform like yeah. stoichiometry to figure out yeah. how, you know, how thin this uh, refractive surface is going to be at this area and so um yeah and uh, how does this uh so i was wondering about how does all this affect the process of what you're doing because the artists they have one kind of framework not one process in what they're doing yeah and then the technical people 
exist in a very different, in a very strict pipeline. And yeah. I guess at Pixar, you do work as well on a very, uh, uh, you know, you're process oriented at Pixar as well with the, you know, you think about building the personality, the story of the character and the story of the environment and the story of the text. Mm -hmm. I, but it's, it is, as you were saying, you don't need the artist to know everything about the technical side. Right. But you do need the technical people to understand nearly every, you know, to yeah. live the Yeah, absolutely. Like, like, you know, and there's a difference between shading one tree to look beautiful, you know, because it's a hero tree that there's a tree house in this tree and characters hanging out in the tree house or whatever and figuring out how to shade a forest um, because you can't shade every tree to a hero degree, of course. You can come up with sort of artist-oriented tools like, okay, if I give you a sample image uh, or a, an example image, can I sample it and figure out about what percentage of the pixels are in this range of the color wheel versus this range versus this range and then apply that distribution to this forest that we have built and drive our shading that way. And so, you know, figuring out what's in their head hmm. is, you know, is about knowing the right questions to ask and, and being able to use that to drive little utilities or scripts or something like that to, to take this hero level shading and, and expand it to, you know, the forest. And so you might say like, okay, for every tree, I want you to vary the hue just a little bit, or I want you to vary the saturation just a little bit, or I want you to vary the value just a little bit. And that works. Like you get some cool variation and that's nice, but it still ends up feeling a little bit like a computer. Yes. Deciding. yes. Like it feels very mathy, very random. Yeah. Um, Cause it is, it is just a, a, a function. Right. And it, it helps, but it's not like, like it's good enough in a lot of cases, but if you're really going to focus on this, it can sometimes not be not be enough because you might want clusters, uh, you know, the the to, this color to be clustered in this area or something like that. Um, you know, that's where the technical part comes in. First, you have to figure out like, okay, how do I make this feel like a human guided it? But um, what technological utilities do I have to develop in order to make this feel less like a computer and more like a human did it. And so like, yeah. uh, you know, I think so much of this job across the spectrum is about finding the right interface between how um, easy and pr a procedural approach can be and how beautiful a manual approach can be. And like, um, finding out where along that spectrum of like easy procedural and beautiful manual um, yeah. to, to land because sometimes it's like one shot, you know what, just do it procedural. It's good enough. It's one shot. We don't care. And sometimes it's a hero yeah. thing and you need it to be painted. And sometimes it's in between. Yeah. Well, I'm sure when we have a conversation like this in 20 years, we will feel really old because the, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the young animators will be using, you know, <laughs> quantum ai procedure to right oh yeah i have this i had this app on my iphone 74 that's uh that's done doing this really cool uh machine learning animation you don't you didn't have that grandpa <laughs> <laughs> yeah you use your hands too much just think it and the computer will follow <laughs> <laughs> but it will be a bit like that because you, yeah. I, I, I mean, you, your background is quite uh, science, sciencey. You know, you started. How did you? How did? Where were were you going towards before you started at Pixar? What were you doing? Um, yeah, it was very sciencey. Um, I was planning on. Um, I was planning on going to. I went to MIT. Um, and the original plan when I went there was to study um, aerospace engineering. Um, I wanted to um, help design and build um, rocket ships that would go to Mars and work at JPL, Jet Propulsion <laughs> Laboratory. And um, um, I kind of like I had landed on that as as my uh, as my goal. And it, like I'm still 
you know, very much enamored with, with that, um, um, with different, the, the, that kind of, that realm of engineering and aerodynamics and all that. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying, I, I am a new convert to watching Formula One and a big part of why I'm into Formula One is all of the aerospace or is all of the aerodynamic um, engineering that's happening. It's just like an up, upside down airplane. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm really into a lot of this science and engineering um, stuff, but I took some yeah. classes that uh, were just in film music and film analysis um, as an elective because I needed to have enough humanities um, classes before I graduated. And I loved them so much that I, I realized I couldn't imagine um, a career that wouldn't at least leave some sort of space for that in my life. And it felt like everyone who was also into aerospace engineering and all this stuff, like that was their life. Like that was it. They lived, breathed, um, this stuff which is great and it's it's awesome it's it's really interesting and i i understand why people are so intensely into that but i felt like i wasn't ready for that to be everything for me i needed i needed some more um um variation and um and so i met some people that had been working at ilm and um and then it all clicked. I was like, this is it. This is exa exactly like the unit, the, 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 the marriage of these two like sides of my brain. Um, this is great. So um, every I was time wondering I see what a SpaceX rocket land in the, in the ocean, I'm like, God, that's really cool. Um, <laughs> I but, then, but then I get to watch, um, you know, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse and I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. Like there's, you know, no yeah. matter what you choose, there's there's something you're not choosing. And so that's just part of life, I guess. Yeah. So what is what what from what you're doing right now, like you know, you watch a rocket land on the on the sea and and your heart races. From the work you've been doing lately, what are the highlight moments where you think I am doing the right thing here? Because I just love this shit. Like, is it it, it doesn't happen often is it or is it mostly when you see the final product or it uh, god yeah it's really it happens a lot like you know i watched the new top gun movie in imax and like the whole uh, you know i watched it in imax because i knew they shot all of the aerial scenes in imax and so I, the whole time that's happening i'm just sitting on my seat just like i can't believe they did this this is so exciting. This is so interesting. This is so um, just thrilling. And like, uh, yeah, I loved it. Um, but then I have, um, you know, I, on like Facebook or Instagram or whatever, I'll fo I follow various accounts like about cinematography and lighting and, and behind the scenes stuff on TikTok or whatever. And they show the process what it looks like on set when someone's making something and like it's just amazing to see um sometimes how little of what you see on the screen is there on the set and other times it's how much you know like the volume that ilm uses for the mandalorian and those sorts of things like that set looks almost exactly the way it ends up looking in camera and it's incredible um so just, I don't know, every, every stage of the process is really interesting to me. And I, and I really enjoy geeking out about it. And, and so yeah, it happens all the time where I'm like, this is so cool. I wish I could do that. I wish I could be a camera operator. Or I wish I could be, you know, a post-production sound mixer or something like that. Um, I listened to the, um, a podcast associated with the TV show, Better Call Saul. And, um, and it's a brilliant show and they have a podcast that comes out the, the day after every episode where they have the editor and the writer and the director and like the actor talking about what it's like on the day. And they talk about so many different parts of the process, like, like the sound mix, um, you know, actors saying, oh, we were told the sound guys were so good that we were allowed to talk over each other during our scenes. And so because the sound editors were so good at their jobs, 
we were able to discover elements of the character, um, we had that freedom to do that. And so just seeing how these different technical aspects can benefit different artistic elements that you would think have nothing to do with each other is just amazing to me. It's all, it's all amazing. Every day this happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, what, uh, what do you see uh, in the near future for, for you? Like uh, you were talking about how you were variating, moving from, from being more creative and more technical. And is, is, do you see this ahead of you for a good time or, and still working in movies? Yeah, I don't think I'll ever stop working in movies. <laughs> I, I mean, I think about it every now and then. Like, you know, I'll get a cold call from a, a video game company or, you know, Facebook or some, you know, some place talking about like um, real time graphics or, you know, metaverse stuff or something like that. And, um, and, you know, like they, they're compelling, interesting problems to solve. Like computer graphics is really interesting to me. And these are interesting computer graphics problems. But they're just, you know, they're not movies. <laughs> and like there's nothing, I don't feel, the, you know, when I put on a VR headset or, or when I, even when I play a video game or something, um, you know, which are interesting, enjoyable experiences, I never feel the way that I do when I'm like sitting in a movie theater. Um, so I like just being, um, there was, there was some awards show where Keanu Reeves was speaking and he gets up and, uh, and before he was presenting the award, he was just like, I love movies. I love making them and I love watching them. <laughs> okay. I'm going to present the award for blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's it. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. So um yeah. there's so many interesting things you know yeah video games are incredible um engineering and and art artistry goes into that um but in the same way that like um yeah watching the cassini space probe return you know photographs of an asteroid or something like all of these things are there's too many interesting things in the world and, and so it's, you know, I have to choose one. And so I'm lucky enough that right now I'm pretty consistently choosing movies. It's possible that would change, but I would be pretty surprised. <laughs> and what, uh, from the human in the project side of what you do, uh, I bet a lot you have learned in the, in the last few years, because we were talking now also about the bridging between two cultures and two frameworks. Mm -hmm. Um, what is it, the challenge that you feel that in what you do, what are the key things that you have to do that are important for your work to be able to, you know, are you, do you have issues with people belonging to the community, to the team, or do you have issues with young people having a different perspective? What, what are the things that, that are tough? Um, well, let's see that the things that are tough are um, like, like with any job, this is, you know, the enjoyment of this job um, really rests almost entirely on how well the team works together, how good the communication is. I, I definitely want, I, I don't have any problem with young people coming in with their own ideas or their own perspectives. Like I actually, prefer that <laughs> to, to um, like, I, I, I want us to have experienced people from outside the studio um, to come in and, and say like, here's how we did things elsewhere and all that. And I want young people to come in and say like, I've been using this tool. I've been using, I don't know, Blender or Substance Designer or something like that in, in school. Why aren't we using that as much as we could? Like I want those kinds of perspectives because the thing, the thing that is difficult for me is when it feels like we're getting into a, a just a groove or a pattern and, and, and then we don't really question it and we don't change and we don't grow. Um, a good friend of mine said at one point, um, our process is our look, which is to say that like, 
the way this department works and then finishes their work and hands off to this department, which then does their work and hands off to this department, like who does what at which, sta at which stage and who they hand it to at which stage and how that handoff happens very much influences what, what, our, what our final look is. And so, you know, for a long time, a lot of our movies look almost the same and it's because we had the same process and the process doesn't change if you don't have new people coming in to question it, whether that's experienced people coming from outside the studio or young people coming in who are using newer tools or who have never worked in this way. And so what I, I would much rather a young person come in with a new idea than, than we hire someone out of college and then just say, this is what we do. This is how we do it. You better learn it. What I want is to not overpower them with our pedigree. I want them to like feel comfortable challenging the way we work. And so it, um, really yeah, all, come on. Yeah. that sounds quite scary. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coming into big time going, right. I've got a lot yeah. of experience from uni and I'm going to share it with you. And we're going to change yeah. all the. You're, you're absolutely right. It's really scary um, to, you know, that's very easy, much easier said than done. And so it's on us to create a culture that makes younger people, less experienced people comfortable sharing their ideas. We might not necessarily go with all of them. It might be that they're having this idea that we already had and we tried and it didn't work. Yeah, but what does that, what does that look like? How do you create that environment in which clever, powerful girls and guys can do that? What is it? The thing that I have been pushing for at Pixar for a long time is... It's something that's it's it's very normal. It's it's a normal process in visual effects, which is called dailies. Um, historically, Pixar has not had a dailies process. What we um, wh where by dailies I mean um, every morning you sh you you create a, a playlist of the work that you know, that all these artists did the day before, and you look at it together with the visual effects artist or the visual effects supervisor, figure out what needs to be done work on, you know, take those marching orders as what you do for that day. And then the next morning, do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Pixar doesn't yeah. have, or did not have that process. It was all department specific reviews, like the lighting department, the sets department, the characters department, the effects department, the sim animation crowds, all of these individual departments would meet with the director and look at only their stuff in isolation. And so like these people might feel comfortable, like new people might feel comfortable with their team right away, you know, like that, that might be, but might be good, but feeling comfortable in a small team and feeling comfortable at Pixar are very different. And so what I have been pushing for, and, and we're still working on it, it's still a work in progress, is something that has more of that dailies feel, which is just, you have people from different departments all of which are contributing to what we're looking at on the screen. Anyone can contribute to the conversation. Anyone can throw out an idea. The benefits that has is that like everyone has more context. Everyone understands what other departments are working on. When you see what other people are doing, when you see someone's work, you can appreciate what they're doing. And, um, and it, it's, it's a more democratic space. Um, and I think creating meeting environments and just a culture in, in general that encourages people at all levels, not just supervisors or leads or whatever to, to speak and be a part of the conversation, I think accelerates the process of helping somebody feel like they belong in that space. And the sooner they feel comfortable in that space, the sooner they're willing to challenge idea to, to talent, challenge things or ask questions. And like, you know, no one's going to do it on day one. Like I am, I, I have a habit of walking into a place with a lot of braggadocio and, and self-confidence um, and being, uh, you know, just making my presence known. Um, but even, you know, even still, like it was several months at Pixar before I felt comfortable making yeah. my voice heard. It's my goal, you know, to, to make Pixar um, a place where people feel comfortable earlier and you know, we talk about wanting to ask ourselves hard questions and, and, and challenge ourselves, but it's hard to, to make, to, to weave that into the culture. 
And yeah. so I'm trying to um, just set up, you know, like it's, it sounds boring, but like, you know, just, if you set up this meeting this way, then the culture changes. And that means that yeah. you can move forward more easily and try out new ideas. And then you end up with a movie that looks like red or uh, turning red coming out like within months of a movie that looks like Lightyear, and like those movies look totally different. And it's because the process was starting to change and, and all of that. And, and it's, I feel like we're, we're starting to, um, because we're building, I think a more solid foundation for good communication uh, for people yeah. at all seniority levels, we can, we can question our process and change things more meaningfully. And yeah, yeah. it's hard. There's no one silver bullet, but. Well, because I wonder, I think, because Pixar has that spirit and they, you always had it. So do you, do you sometimes have conversations between the senior people? Have you ever had about this, like saying, oh, I think we're getting a little bit stuffy here. Or is this, do you discuss this in detail with other senior people? Or is this something, do you know what I mean? Do you check yourself? Yeah. It, uh, yes. The, the the difficulty the, one of the obstacles to that at Pixar and you know I don't know what it's like at Aston Martin but um, you know at Pixar it's a little harder to do that holistically because you have so many different productions happening concurrently um, you know you like we had Turning Red in production at the same time as as Lightyear at the same time as Luca at the same time as Onward like all of these things were happening at once. And each production is kind of like its own company. Um, and like, we're all under the same umbrella at, at Pixar, but like, it's, it's very hard to say at the very, very top, we're going to make a change that's going to be inherited by every production. And so in general, kind of the most you can hope for in the near term is to change the culture on your production. Um, and hope that it is successful enough that the senior people on the production, the producer, the director, the project manager, or the production manager, associate producer, that they, uh, you know, visual effects soup, that they will talk to their corresponding positions on other productions and say like, hey, this is something that worked well with us. Um, I'm sure that sort of thing happens, but they have their own sets of, priorities and and um and so i'm sure i don't know during those meetings how much those are the kind of questions they ask because those are sort of yeah. like company-wide questions as opposed to and they tend to well, it's, it's yeah. easier to have yeah. project specific conversations or share project experiences um so yeah it, it is it is difficult um yeah I'm, I'm trying to, to... I'm sorry. I'm asking you questions yeah. that I have the feeling you don't usually have to discuss out no, loud. No, I, 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 do, I, I do discuss these things a lot, um, but usually on a smaller scale um, because I don't, you know, a, I'm just a guy. I think one of the things that we do that's very valuable that I don't think people pay quite enough attention to... I, um, just how useful it is it's much more common for people to bounce between different levels so like you can have somebody who is relatively new to the studio being considered for a leadership role um, um that's a pretty recent development like in the last few years like before it was like you know at least five years before you would be a, a, in um contention for a leadership uh, or even supervisor role um but you do frequently have people somebody who is an individual contributor on this show a supervisor on this show a lead on this show and an individual contributor on this show and just sort of bounces around um you know like the um the lighting the director of photography for lighting on luca um you know, I was working closely with in my role as sequence lead, but then we, when I joined Lightyear as just a set shading artist, um, she was also on Lightyear as just an individual contributor in lighting. And so like, she was suddenly like, we were both exactly on equal footing. Um, 
And so it's interesting that this is something that happens relatively fluidly at Pixar because if like if there's a permanent leadership or supervisor class then um it sends a message that like oh these people are better than these people or these people are better i mean not not better yeah. people but better at their jobs or or more yeah. Yeah. you know know things better than anyone else and and when you have a, a little bit more fluidity then those roles become less about is this person better at their job than this person it becomes less competitive and it becomes more about like look we need somebody who is a good hub for information who can advocate for somebody um and um and so the role like takes on a different definition um and so like when i was a lead on the blue umbrella which is a, a short from about 10 years ago like i had a lot of people on my team that were at least as senior as me and so i was really nervous about being in charge of them like that sounded ridiculous to me i was like these people are just as good as me if not better why am i telling them what to do and then I forget who told me that like, yeah, no, it's not, you're not telling them what to do because you're better than they are. You're telling them what to do because you have information that they don't yes. and so you have the information to help people make the right decision. And that's all your job is on this show is to be the person with this information. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so by having that fluidity, it changes the kind of the nature of the job description of like one that's less competitive to one that's more about just like, all right, you're the point person for information right now. Yeah. And, um, and so I think when you have that kind of traveling between positions, because people um, feel more equal, um, they are more likely again, to challenge things, to talk to somebody that, you know, to be an individual contributor talking to a supervisor and say, and raising a complaint or a concern or something like that, because like, hey, on the last show, we were at the same level or on the last show, I was your boss. And on this show, you're my boss. But like, that doesn't mean anything. We're just colleagues that trust each other. Um, yeah. And so, and, yeah. And we're all, we have all a very clear aim that it is about, getting the best out of, out of everybody in the team and doing the best project possible. You know, like yeah. you, 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 you all know. It was very interesting because the, the, you know, everybody I know in the film industry is super hierarchical. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So like a friend of mine that was trying to move from the art department into the design department in films, he had done really senior things in the art department and he was ready to go down a little bit into the senior department. But for him, it was really difficult to take the hit to decide. And he thought this will set me back so much. I really want to change in. Yeah. So that, that's really amazing that in Pixar, you have that fluidity in, in the hierarchy. Yeah. It, it's pretty cool. And like, uh, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of people don't, it's something that's just so, commonplace and I think a lot of people don't notice it but I think it's really important you know like um yeah so um oh shoot I forgot what I was gonna say oh I mean you know there there still is you know one of the downsides of so many people having been you know having had senior roles or or something like that it is that for every leadership position um, on a show, there are a lot of people who are qualified to do it. And so a lot yeah. of people who are interested in doing it and they can't pick everyone. And so I think sometimes that can result in frustration of like people feeling like they aren't given enough opportunities to grow. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I don't know how to separate those things. They feel kind of inextricably linked of like, yeah. if you have this fluidity, if you trust enough of your workforce to take on this kind of responsibility, then by definition, you have more people available than positions available. Yeah. And, um, and, and so. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's, music is so important in your movies as well. It's like, true. So you incorporate um, it early on and already you start to familiarize yourself with the music they're going to use. Um, no, that, that, um, that all sorts of, sort of happens in parallel. So we have... Um, um, our 
you know, our story reels process where, you know, we have storyboard artists working closely with editors and the director and the writer um, to come up with a cut of the movie. Yeah. It's only using storyboards. And um, um, that will use, you know, not only temp voices, scratch dialogue, um, but um, temp music as well. So they'll use music from another movie. Maybe it's another Pixar movie. Maybe it's just something from, I don't know, Requiem for a Dream or whatever. Um, and they'll play music from another movie just to help guide the like um, momentum of the edit, the, the timing of everything, the feel of it all. Um, and that temp soundtrack lasts pretty late into the game. Like, so we will watch it and then, you know, we'll, people will give their notes and then they'll, they'll take all of those notes and come up with changes to the story and, and um, draw new storyboards and cut it all together again with new dialogue or whatever, or new timing or, um, and so the editorial team is working on this process, like for the entire duration of the movie, this is very different from the live yeah. action thing. Cause live action, you know, you come yeah. up with a script and a shooting schedule. Um, and like, you might be talking with the editor or the cinematographer or the director about like, what shots you need for coverage, but it's all about how do we shoot things in a way that allows us to edit something together well at the end, but editing always happens at the end. Here, it's a part of the process from the beginning all the way to the end. And so over the course yeah. of the whole movie, as we are working on the film, they'll swap in renders that we have worked on and replace, yeah. um, replace things, drawings with renders, and they will also replace temp score with um, final recorded score, but um, actually recording the score doesn't happen until I don't know, maybe the last year. Yeah. Uh, and so production is well underway, and most people, not even not even the animators, um, I think, know exactly what maybe animation a little bit, but know exactly what the score is going to be. Yeah. Uh, so that for us is sort of like a wonderful thing that happens like we're getting so used to watching these shots with scratch dialogue or with with temporary score and then once they swap in the real dialogue and the real animation to that and once they swap in the real music it's like the whole thing comes alive um which yeah. is awesome but it means that we don't really know how the music is going to influence it until pretty late yeah yeah, yeah. and it's so important yeah and what yeah. about, I, I wanted to ask you one question a little bit about your way of pitching. Uh, I know in your job, it's not exactly a pitch, like if you're pitching a business idea, but do you have any way where you think about your, when you're pitching something, do you have a way to do research, to prepare, to show something? Do you have any recommendations for how to pitch an idea? Is this something I, you think about or you... I, I don't think too much about it. Are, are you talking about like pitching a movie idea or are you talking about like pitching an idea to the tools department for a new piece of software or just any, all of the above? Um, mostly the second because the, okay. pitching, yeah, I don't think you've done a lot of pitching a movie idea. No, have I you? Have not. <laughs> nope. So I, was thinking, I was thinking more about in your profession, in your, you know, like what you are doing. I see. Yeah. Um, do you have a technique, a way of doing like, or, or have you come up with a craft, a way that you tend to organize things to present them? Um, I, not, not really. I tend to like, I wrote a pitch for dailies, um, uh, you know, about 10 years ago. And, um, this is when Pixar decided like, okay, we want to have like, we want to devote a few days and a, and a process to like, you know, soliciting ideas from the people um, on how we can improve things. And it could be anything. It could be cultural. Um, it could be technological. It could be artistic, you know, whatever you want. And so I, I wrote a pitch for dailies 
And it got enough traction that they were like, all right, pitch it to the executives. And so my friend and I wrote a presentation, um, wrote like a wiki page and then um, based a presentation on that. Um, and then we were working with um, just someone, someone pretty high up um, to sort of help us, like we would present it to her and she would poke holes in it and figure out what, where the weaknesses were, what are the executives going to ask. Um, and so we got to pitch that to them. And that was pretty, pretty awesome. Um, what did you learn in the process? What did you learn in that process when you were pitching that her to prepare? Um, it was, it was interesting. I learned, um, <laughs> I, I learned that so many of the things that I think about are not the things that, um, the executives think about, you know, cause I'm thinking about the process of making a movie and they're thinking about, you know, the business side of it. Um, not exactly how will this, well, maybe a little bit like, okay, cool. How does your idea affect our bottom line. Um, and so I was, I was originally pitching this idea of dailies as like a way for people to communicate better and collaborate and develop connections um, that allow us to make a better picture in the end. And all of those things are true, but they were asking questions like, why is this, is this more efficient? Like, sure, everyone being BFFs is great, but like, does this make the process faster? How does this, how does, uh, you know, we have a pretty established process. We've made a lot of movies that have made a lot of money and you want to change this process this, that, that is established and that we know works. Um, why, not, why should we change it at all? Yeah. Why should we change it now? Um, what are the effects of this change going to be? And those are just, whew, those are questions I hadn't thought of. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I did, you know, I, I had some answers for some of them of like, look, part of the process, the, the way we work is like this person, then this person, the, the, what is it? The waterfall approach. Like, so like, by the time we get here, we might not realize something doesn't work for weeks or months. And if we do it this way, we might learn what doesn't work sooner and we'll be able to change gears when it's, um, easier and less expensive to do so. Or we might, um, be able to come up with something that looks just as good in less time. Um, yeah. That was more the kind of questions they were asking about. And that was not yeah. something I was used to. <laughs> um, because I think, I, that's, I think that's really hard at first to learn because when you think, when you haven't pitched a lot in different contexts, you think a pitch is a pitch. But yeah. as soon as you have a little bit of experience, you realize the most important part of the pitch is to know your stakeholder, know yes. what kind of questions they tend to ask, no? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and um, I just didn't, I didn't know the stakeholder. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I was able to, we, we were able to, you know, some of this was, our person was able to help us come up, you know, think about these things a little bit more completely before we brought it to them. But some of it was questions we didn't expect, but we... Um, based on just our conversations with her, we were able to better understand the kind of questions they were asking or the kind of answers they were looking for um, so that we could more completely answer their questions. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was helpful. Cool. And uh, so that's great. Uh, do you have any challenges at work that are starting to be a problem for you with your teams, with your life at work, or with your creativity, or or with research, is there anything that is is a bit difficult that you think you would like to hear processes that might improve that, or is that you know maybe that's part of what you do at Pixar, so you don't right? Um, that's oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so frequently when I think about questions like that, I'm thinking about like individual productions um, and like, okay, well, we, we can, this didn't work on this show. And so let's think about that for the next show. But um, I, I think if I, if I think more about like the shading department, um, 
there, there is sort of a, I'm not sure exactly how to describe it. It's not a schism. Um, it's not like, um, you know, uh, like two factions battling or anything like that, but there are two perspectives. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. And one of them is like in, in, let's say sets shading, like, okay, my job is to take an asset that somebody modeled and shade it and make it ready to give to hand off to lighting. Um, how can I make that process as smooth and enjoyable as possible? And so, you know, one of the answers is, okay, well, let's come up with a tool that has like a real-time renderer so we can change our shading network or parameters and see those effects in real time, because that helps you get an intuitive sense of what this parameter does and how it affects the surface. And we can quickly tumble things around, move lights. Um, and, um, and yeah. they're not wrong. Like that makes that process so much easier and so much better. And that's great. It's built on a really um, robust foundation. Um, okay. Like it, it has some very, some, it, it has some assumptions baked in, but if it satisfies those assumptions, um, it works beautifully. And so there's this one perspective that's like, okay, how do we take this workflow and refine it even more? So it's just so fucking good so that we have, um, you know, it's easy to create a node and connect to this and like it just it, everyone can work and be in the zone and that'll be great. And that's, that's great. That's a totally worthwhile perspective, but it's, there's two problems with it. One of them is that um, you're only thinking about one thing at a time. You're thinking about one prop, one character, one tree. Um, and uh, in sets, at least, you frequently have to think about multiple things. And so yeah. this thing that's good at one thing is not necessarily a good tool to use when shading multiple things. Um, the other problem is um, that it makes these assumptions. Um, the assumptions are um, a modeler is going to model this thing in Maya or 3ds Max or Blender or whatever. They're going to have a built you know, a bit of geometry, USD geometry, and it's going to be all ready. And I'm going to pick that up and I'm going to start shading it. And then I will include my shading in the build of the asset. And I'm going to hand that off to lighting. Um, which is, again, if those assumptions are satisfied, it works great. Um, but if they're not satisfied, it's really hard. And those, there are many ways I might not be satisfied. Like what if I have to shade something that's generated by the effects department? What if I, what if there are standard light dome doesn't really capture how this thing is going to end up being in the shot? Like, what if I need this to, what if I need to do this look development in the context of, a, pardon me, of a shot? Um, what if the geometry is animated? Like, what if this is not, not coming from effects, but like, you know, what yeah. if it's a, a coral that's softly waving or something like that? Yeah. You know, and you want to see like how it looks at different frames. Um, and so um, when yeah. those aren't satisfied or when you're working, when you're doing multiple things at once, then you start to get into a situation where like, okay, I might need to write a little bit of code every now and then, or I might need to work in the same environment as the lighting artist um, instead of my own dedicated space. Um, and um and so that's a whole, that's essentially, it's a whole different environment. Like you're using all these different tools right. and it's, it's all technically shading and look development, but it's a totally different set of problems that you're trying to solve. And, yeah. um, and so um, I think one perspective tends to focus on, let's make this process that it's the, the more likely case, let's make it as amazing as possible um, yeah. to the exclusion of almost all else. And others are like, okay, but what a, I want to be able to, I want to be empowered to work on these edge cases. I don't want yeah. to have to be forced into a pipeline that doesn't know how to handle these edge cases. Yeah. Um, but that means diverting resources away from this thing that's for most people into this area that's like only for people who are comfortable coding or doing yes. more yeah. dry technical problems. And so like um, 
technology that can more easily unify those viewpoints, something that is um, streamlined enough for just a, a person to come in and work as in the way they're comfortable with, but which is versatile enough to allow for deviation from the normal case feels a little bit like a holy grail to me. <laughs> um, <It> sounds, that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that sounds like a unified theory of relativity and quantum <laughs> mechanics. Which is <laughs> it, just as easy to come up with it, that. Solution. It does. It does. It's it's um, yeah. It's it's very difficult to reconcile those those perspectives, partially because of just like you know emotional or cultural reasons. Like if if you're saying I want to focus all of our efforts on making this work pipeline really good. Um, then it's easy to misunderstand the other perspective as like, I want to take all of our resources to, to making this more technical pipeline really yeah. good. And even though that's not necessarily what people are saying, it sounds, it's, it can easily turn into a conversation between, is this a pipeline that's been developed for artists or is this a pipeline that's been developed for technical people, technical artists versus finer artists. Um, yeah. and, and so that, that's what I mean by, it's not exactly like, factions or, or or something like that uh it's not conflict exactly but no. it can sometimes feel like people are sort of put into these two buckets of like are you more of an artist or are you more of a technical person and who should the pipeline be for and yes. so it's hard to come up with I, you know i that's another thing i think a lot about is how can we come up with a pipeline that um isn't for either of them but allows for both uh, yeah. Uni unified, yeah, we should call it the unified theory of the pipelines. Uni yeah, like yeah, unified theory of pipeline, unified pipeline theory. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think when you start to, you have no chill as a creative, as we said in the past about you, you're the artist with no chill. Once <laughs> you get a bit tired, I think you would be a really good teacher. You should start thinking about that move because I think when you get a bit tired of this crazy super intense creative work you could be a really really good professor so i want to plant that seed in your head all so right you're ready for that yeah it's that so good to talk to you i always i it always amazes me how listening to you makes me think about the world and about you know oh, thank you yeah it really it really like all you know from textures to technical versus artists it's really cool to hear you so thank you very much. Thank gonna, you. Uh, Always a pleasure. Thank you much. And uh, I will see you on Thursday uh, for the half an hour session. I will contact you to, for the details, if that's okay. Sounds great. Excellent. Thank you very much, Francisco. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. We'll talk soon. Thanks a lot. Have a good, have okay. a good day. Yeah, actually. Bye. Bye. Thank you.